Welcome to our first episode of the, of the mini podcast that is as of yet unnamed. Um, I got ChatGPT to come up with some, some ideas. Um, we've got, uh, and I asked for um, synonyms to like water cooler chat, because that's kind of what this is, but a podcast done thing. Uh, so we've got cubicle banter, um, <laughs> corridor catch up. Uh, casual office conversations, uh, corridor confab, uh, and informal work discussions. So I don't know if there's uh, any any favourites that stand out for anyone there as a as a title. What was a cubicle? Uh, oh, there's a few. Uh, cubicle banter. Cubicle banter. I, I think it, it suggests that we're in a set. It suggests that we're in the toilet. And <laughs> <laughs> that is what I thought as well. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm, I not, I'm not a saying you can't. You, you, if you wanted to go into a toilet cubicle and record it from there, I'm not going to stop you. Um, it just That's where you feel be... most relaxed. Yeah, ex exactly. <laughs> you know, you've got to let it all go, let it all out in more ways than one. I was having a conversation with one of my friends the other day. Uh, about vacuums and we were both getting really like really into a, a nice John Lewis Curry's like argument or like a friendly argument and where's best what's the best warranty um, and then she when it then arrived she bought it from from Curry's other retailers are available yeah. and um, she I was just so I was genuinely so happy and excited for her for the purchase of a vacuum and I just I think young younger James when you know he was at uni wouldn't have given like two shits about a vacuum but now i'm mm. i'm absolutely thrilled to go through a search result page of a hundred vacuums and comparing mm. the wattage and the is it bagless is it not how big is the chamber how many bags you need what are the cost of the bags loved it i could have done a spreadsheet no on it. bagless i feel nowadays bagless there's no need why there, there, there's no reason why you need to change a bag now and with 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 now technology um maybe i've been spoiled because we've got dyson so i'm gonna throw that one in there but um, it's a very old Dyson. It cost us mm. like 70 quid back in, I think, 2006 or something. But it, mm. it, yeah, it, it's still working and it doesn't is, lose suction. Is Henry still on the list? Or has Henry kind of made his way so, out of fashion now? Well, my I see Henry, has a Henry. I do oh. have a Henry as well. I mean, I, I, see, I see Henry's a lot uh, like... Um, uh, as I say, institutions uh, like public places, or like corporations, mm. or like offices, actual like professional offices. So yeah. he must be doing something right, or maybe he's just got like a monopoly on. Mm. You know, they've signed a contract that you have to only use that, even though Dyson's better. I would say. Is this, see, is this where see, this, we're is, gonna... this is the level of my conversation now? Talking about talking <laughs> about who's this? This is. <laughs> is this where we're going to be dismantling big vacuum? In, yeah, in, yeah. it's going to be like a ten part like uh, murder. Was it true crime style podcast? But it yeah. said it's going to be dismantling big vacuum, big Hoover. Diversify the vacuum. <laughs> well, you know, in the same way that was it uh, like a huge court hearing when they were, when they were trying to like split up Facebook and Google because I've got and 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 Twitter because I've got just a monopoly on all like social media and everything internet related. So yeah, yeah, we need to do one of those. Yeah, we need to do. But... <laughs> But focusing on the issues that people really care about, which is their vacuums yeah. and home cleanliness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah. So I just got finished watching Sex Education. Um, I'm assuming everyone here has probably watched it by now. I All finished it? it last night. Yeah, final two episodes you last night. It. it was a okay. big marathon. <laughs> yeah. What do you think? Of the whole thing or it. the ending or just everything? Uh, well, tell me about the ending and then we'll work backwards. What do you think about the ending? I thought the last two episodes were quite... Uh, they were quite dramatic. It was quite um, emotional and it kind of all... All the stories did tie up quite nicely. I thought the ending was quite satisfying. Mm. Um, and it wasn't all happy ending for everyone, um, I guess, which I think was quite realistic for the yeah. kind of issues they were talking about. Um, but I think there were some really lovely moments in the final, um, the final episode, particularly with Eric, and then with um, oh my gosh, I can't remember their names, the couple, um, Rowan, Roman and, Abby. and Roman yeah. and Abby. 
yeah, yeah. there were some like really lovely moments with them as well um and i thought that was really important to be seen on a tv show so yeah mm. i really like the ending what, what did you what did you think did anyone else notice that dodgy mo is um the guy from game of thrones <laughs> i haven't no, seen I game of thrones so I, I didn't pick that up but yeah jack gleason <laughs> Um, the one that plays the king that gets that they get poisoned. Um, uh, yeah. Anyway, I I mean, what I thought of it, I I, I thought it was great. I've watched I've watched all three seasons, all four seasons. Um, wasn't a massive fan of the last one, um, but I did. I I I really like this one, um, and I like that they put on um, diversity, not diversity, or like a, a diversity and inclusion. Sometimes being a bit bureaucratic and uh, sometimes just being in name only sometimes just being the face of a place without actually um so the, the, they they overlook for example they overlook disabilities um but they had this wonderful colorful aesthetic and they had these you know safe spaces and corners but just like okay let's get to the front of it how we, we need to focus on access and that's something they constantly overlook so i, I, I like i like when they did that mm -hmm. One of I I agree. One of my friends was te was saying I can't remember who it might have been Yanni actually, um, as heard on this podcast. Uh, she said it definitely felt like some bits were written with like diversity and inclusion consultants in mind, um, because it definitely. I think the bit that stood out for me in the, I mean there was lots of things that stood out, but one bit that I stuck in my head was um, when in series in the episode like midway through the series. Um, they went to a gay night out, like a gay nightclub, or it was a gay queer night. And um, they went to go take un unnamed, unlabeled drugs. Um, and they were like, well, I'm the designated person, so I'm going to make sure that you're safe. Um, and it kind of just had the kind of like, and everything's fine, because yay <laughs> um and there were definitely a few moments throughout the series that really felt like and we've solved the problem because we included oh. this line um mm. so it sometimes felt a little a little bit too trite um but i did really appreciate that the balance was always there because i think t all tv a lot of media lacks that balance um so yeah i i liked it overall but sometimes it was just a little bit over egged um, I do to... agree with you there. I think that there are a lot of moments in the show where obviously they were talking about so many different issues representing so many different identities. And obviously with the number of characters in there and the length of each episode, it is quite impossible, I guess, to go really, really in, de mm -hmm. in depth and nuanced with all of it. Um, and I think every conversation they had that was about an issue or there was a confrontation or there was someone sharing their emotions, it almost went in like the best possible way for those people yeah. involved. It was very like this is how you have the conversation in a healthy way. And they demonstrated that kind of on screen. Mm. And I don't think that's meant to be realistic necessarily, because obviously emotions are more heightened or people don't always say the right thing. But I think it's just good to show it in a way of like, this is how it could be, or mm. these are some of the things you could say. And it was a, a lot of it was quite like therapy speak as well. And obviously a, a large theme of the show is therapy. So I kind of understand why they did that. Mm. Um, so yeah, it's not necessarily realistic for how those issues would be spoken about in the real world, but I think it's nice to just see them being spoken about like that. Um, yeah. And people can kind of take inspiration from that about how they could be more open about their own things or more understanding of someone else. But yeah, at times it was a little bit too DNI speak to be realistic, but the show mm -hmm. isn't realistic necessarily. So I didn't mind too much. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, I, I think that was a very good summary. I, um, if you always have like the suspension of disbelief i mean that was the whole point of the show it was always suspension of disbelief because it was always confused as to where it was set even though eventually it was it was always really clear that it was in england but they had so many like blends of like american high school culture mm -hmm. especially in the first few series that didn't really happen it kind of they lost that and forgot about it later on but i remember the first series was like where is this even though everyone was it was set in england and it was the cast was British most for the most part mm. um yeah it was I think it can it can get away with it more because it had the uh, I guess more obvious suspension of disbelief where it's just like we don't know where this is and it's really obvious um I liked it I liked it mm. as a whole I think I guess that's intentional to make it seem 
universal. Mm. And I guess with that, because I, when I first thought this, I, I, I don't know what I don't know what article I read, but I think it's in the the author said it's first and foremost educational. Um, because there's always, regardless of what kind of narrative, what drama is going on, in between there's little segments that are actually quite informative mm. about about puberty and growing up and sexual orientation and things like that. So it does it does seem very educational, even though it's catered to eighteen year olds. And you you would assume, I guess, that people by that age would be quite informed, especially nowadays. But um, yeah, so I, I'm I'm I wonder if it it specifically doesn't have a locus or doesn't identify the, the locus because it's meant to just apply to everyone. Everyone goes through these these things. Everyone has sex. Everyone knows. Yeah. Yeah, and I think the same is reflected in like the styling of it. So a lot of it looks quite seventies and eighties, but also they're yeah. all using phones. So and all the colours as well were quite uh, towards the eighties side and all their houses as well like I really loved all the like interior design of it and I'm like no one's house really looks like that now it's like millennial gray everywhere you know so I quite Mm. liked that they pushed that side a bit more as well Mm. um and also with the educational bit that you were just talking about Eddie I think I really liked in this series how they brought like the parents in like a little bit more like Mm. with Cal's mum where they're kind of going through the early stages of a transition and how the the parents kind of feel about that and then Jackson's parents when He's trying to work out who his real dad is and everything. I think it was nice to bring in that different like family dynamic as well. So I think like even if you're maybe already a parent or you're a bit older, I think you'd still really benefit from watching the show to understand what maybe your child's gonna may go through or their friends are going through or something like that. So yeah. I think it could be educational kind of across the board. Mm. I think that's even depicted in the title, isn't it? Like in the opening titles, they always have a new scene of something different going on that is comedic, but also kind of true. Not always comedic, but like largely Mm. relatable. Like I think everyone over the course of four series will have probably found an opener to that show that they would have gone like, ha, been there. Um, In just like the really wild or really pedestrian different ways that people, people have sex. Um, and I, I liked that it would it made it very feel very real and that was a really mm. nice way that they increased representation um, in a in a different and new way because I don't know not many shows express representation sexually it's mostly through other like characteristics or things that we all have in common um, I guess the only exception to that is Channel 4's was it Naked Attraction. <laughs> Who was your favourite? Oh, hmm? is that still going? Make the yeah. question. Ask for a friend. One of one of my <laughs> one of my friends has dated someone that has been on Naked Attraction, and that was that. That's how she led into the fact that she was dating them, because like they've been on Naked Attraction, and my reply was, "What series? What episode? I'm gonna guess." <laughs> <laughs> is that weird? It's probably a bit weird, but they put it on TV, so it's fair game. It's on TV. It's fair game. I'd I'd be curious. You, know, with, 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 you can't with you can't if it's there. You can't not. It's on it's on TV. So therefore, it's fine. <laughs> Who was your favourite character in Sex Education, or was there a particular story that both of you were really drawn to, or found the most interesting? I quite liked um, how Adam had changed. If you if you mm. like, so going from season one, he was this bully who was, I, I guess, quite popular. Um, but so you know, um, like three bumps up, and then by the fourth series, by the fourth season, he's like he, he almost doesn't know who he is, and um, but he he learns that he's he kind of learns it's bisexual, and he 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 he's giving advice to his mom and dad about about how to express themselves, and he's it's kind of he, he's realizing that his mom and dad are, are sexual beings, and that. Their relationship aren't permanent. They're not permanently. So although they 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 separated, they're, they're I think towards the end they're flirting with the idea of actually getting back together again, and he's okay with that. He realizes it's not about him, mm. and yeah, this is although he's very much part of their life. They're not. He's not the only thing in their life, you know. And they've also got each other. So that was that was nice one. I don't know if he's my favorite character. But that was that was probably one one of my most interesting stories. Um, mm. The most interesting story I saw in there. I, I loved Eric's story, how it flourished in series four. Um, it was it was relatable because I've I've had kind of um, 
say in cat i think i've had encounters with christianity um and that has plonked me into um the atheism agnostic camp quite firmly because of my encounters with christianity um because i was kind of brought up with a not in a faith household but my school was a faith school um so it was kind of thrust upon me and i sort of accepted it and then started questioning and then had some bad stuff and it rejected it um and so i was really fascinated by uh eric obviously faced uh eric faced a different facet of christianity that i um didn't experience but he was much more into the church um and was i i i loved his uh encounters with i'm assuming it's god i think it was god or at least an angel of god um how god was just like well I made you this way so that uh, people would you shine brighter so that others can see in the darkness um and how he he kind of he turned his his faith kind of stayed the same but he turned his um the discrimination that he felt into something tangible and actionable to kind of try and make a difference um because i think eric as a pastor i would go to that church i would love to see him <laughs> um i would that would be that would make me go to church on sundays um so i love that i thought that was a really it was a damaging but healing journey um and i, I think it was kind of goes back to what we say earlier it was just the, the perfect way to have dealt with something that was really that challenged his identity and his sense of self um and how he overcame it in the best possible way um which was really nice yeah definitely i think like identity and finding out who you are was a real theme in this I guess especially with the age that they are in this series I imagine that's when lots of people go through maybe another change obviously there are more in your early 20s late 20s da 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 we're all going through them all the time oh yes Um, but it felt like that was a real theme across a lot of them and one that I really related to in a way or just found quite interesting was Amy I mean I think she's a really iconic character anyway Um, I think she's so funny and just really I don't know, she's just like a pleasure to watch in the show, Um, but particularly in the last series where she's finding her self-expression through her art and kind of not knowing what she has to say, not knowing how to say it, thinking she doesn't have anything to say. And I think maybe lots of people, especially if you're a young person, you might relate to that if you haven't kind of got it figured out straight away. And Mm. then watching her kind of discover what she wants to do through her photography and her art and sort of connecting to the people around her, I thought was really nice to watch. Um, And I'm sure, again, lots of people probably relate to that who am I, what am I doing? I've got nothing important to say, feeling, um, but then you do kind of blossom into that and everyone does have something to say. So yeah. I thought her story was really nice. Mm. Oh, that's, that's a great show. And also I, 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 I want to shout out Jean as a character too, um, because I think she was, yeah, Jean. <laughs> Tillian Anderson. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Um, I liked her representation. I mean, she was a, she was a therapist, um, but her I guess her um, her character was one of someone that kind of ha- sort of has their shit together. Not like yeah. completely, but like definitely presenting as someone that has their shit together. Um, and how um, how she just kind of loses it, and you can see like you can visually see her character arc more than in what she says because you see she just becomes more and more disheveled the house becomes a mess and you can see there's loads of signs of her going into like postnatal depression but it's just not uh, acknowledged um like verbally or by any of the characters until i don't know is it two-thirds of the way through where finally she kind of i think it cuts to a scene of her maybe crying at the end of the show or something like that and even then it's not talked about until later um and I just, I, not because I ha- have had postnatal depression um, or I am indeed have been or will be a mother because um, I've no desire to have children. I very related to the kind of like, it's like the, the was it the duck analogy or the swan analogy where it's just like seems cool above water, but like mm. you're like frantically pedaling underneath. And I liked, I just really appreciated that depiction. Um, that even even a therapist, someone who deals with other people's mental health problems, like struggled and needed support, um, which was sad but nice because she she was fine in the end. Spoiler. <laughs> and I think that Brilliant also Anderson. goes back to what we were saying around like 
how a lot of the parents or adults are like uh, depicted a little bit more in this. So I think especially when you're a kid or a young person, you kind of think that your parents are invincible or adults are invincible. And they started to kind of break that down a little bit. So like what you were just saying around, like nobody really realized what she was going through through the show. It's because people think, oh, parents are fine. Therapists mm -hmm. are great. You mm -hmm. know, nothing can yeah. touch them. Um, but we saw it with her, with Adam's dad. Um, like you sort of see that they are real people with real emotions and they don't have it all sorted, even though they're adults. Yeah. Um, so I quite liked that they put that in to, I don't know, that might be helpful for older people watching it to kind of be like, it's fine for you also to not have everything sorted. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not just kind of the teenagers going through puberty and everything. It's kind of everyone. Mm. 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 And you're going to say Gillian, Gillian Anderson. I just, if it's more Gillian Anderson love, I want to hear it. <laughs> it, it, it was it was exactly that. I just thought she she, she played such a great character. I just love the love the way she acts and um as you said, it looked like she has <laughs> she has her stuff together. She has she, in the first three seasons at least. Um, she has this desirable kind of almost like stoic, like huge emotional intelligence around herself. Um, and she's not afraid to talk to people it, until it's about herself. Um, and it or don't talk to people about their problems until she has her own problems, which she doesn't really share willingly. I'd say, but yeah, she does that brilliantly. I also really love her as um, Margaret Thatcher in The Crown. Um, <laughs> mm. <laughs> she, she does it wonders. Oh, brilliant! Um, the only the only the only person that plays okay. Margaret Thatcher in my head is Meryl Streep. I thought we're going down a different tangent now, but I. Was, uh, I have my issues with Meryl Streep's depiction. I thought it was a bit too shrill. I thought she played her a little bit too shrill in comparison to, G to Gillian Anderson. But that, I guess that's for another time. Are we uh, team Meryl or team Gillian? Team, team Gillian. Cast that. your votes Absolutely in the comments. <laughs> yeah. No, let's not, I let's not pit women against each other. Um. <laughs> well, one got the Oscar, to be fair. Yeah. Hey. One got the Oscar. Um, but one is Jean Melbourne, to be fair. Mm. <laughs> uh, anyway. I kind of wish they explored Ruby a bit more. Mm. Um, they kind of touched on it, saying that, okay, this is why she seems very materialistic or, or cold, because, because of what happened in her childhood. Um, but I kind of wish they had gone a bit further with her and been like, I guess, well, maybe that's the point. Like, everyone's in their own journey, you know, and it's not all going to happen at the same time. Not everyone's going to have this wonderful, happy, happy ending where everyone um, changed emotionally. Um, but because Ruby was very much one note, I think, throughout it. Um, mm -hmm. But I kind of wish they, they they went down down her route a bit more. Mm. I guess that's where the series fell down in, in, like, what we were saying before, that there were so many stories that the only way they could tie them up was by perfectly tying them up. And then even so, like some characters had a kind of slightly unsatisfactory ending. Mm. Um, or it was left open-ended, which could have probably made room for another series. Um, but obviously yeah. it's done, it is now done. Yeah, I Spin think off. with anything like that, with that many characters, it's going to be impossible to really understand like the deep aspects of them and like their whole story. But I think given that they did do very well especially if they did kind of explore someone in quite a surface level way i think the things they chose to shine light on were quite important um I agree. particularly with like the trans and non-binary characters i think obviously that is such a complex experience for someone but i think the way that they handled it was quite sensitive and maybe quite realistic i think i think i read an interview with the actor who plays roman um, and they were saying it was just really great to actually show the positive parts of being trans as well, which again, mm. doesn't really get depicted in the media um, basically at all. Um, so I think that they handled that really well. Obviously you could go so much deeper, um, but I think the things that they chose to share were quite like carefully selected. Um, mm. Yeah. It's always going to be hard with a series like that. I think with that many characters. Yeah. I think overall done well. Good vibes, yes. and I'm very happy that it exists. And I wish I had it when I was growing up. Oh, 100 percent. Yeah, mm. <laughs> yeah. I always think that about shows and films like that. Like 
love Simon, even though it had its issues with its depiction of the family like unit being, it was just the perfect white thing, yeah. middle class American family with a big house and all the money and like liberal mum that's a, that's a therapist and a, a dad that is inexplicably handsome and like yeah it had a had issues with its but it then had its merits of being the first ish kind of like mainstream studio to pick up just a bit yeah. of an average bit of a shit story but with a gay theme and that everyone everyone of every um orientation or otherwise needs a shit film that he can go like oh we need a bit of trash like we all deserve <laughs> it um and i wish i had that stuff growing up i think that would have been much much nicer charted that way i think it i mean sex education kind of shows both shows how far we've come but also that there are other issues within so <laughs> If I was taking a story about someone who's trans or someone who's gay or someone who's asexual, usually the trope is, oh my God, I'm the only one I'll never be accepted. Like that, it, it feels like they're, you know, they're, they've had to hide, constantly hide who they are and try to blend in. Whereas I find sex education is like, everyone's different. Every, like everyone's different. And we've kind of reached that panacea-ish. But, but now that everyone's different is now you trying to find your own identity mm. knowing that that your your sexuality isn't all you are mm. Mm -hmm. and it's a nice it's a nice well i, I think that's a good progression um mm. of of what at least where we're at and i i appreciate that a lot well, and lucky i guess lucky youth i don't know i think it's also hard being being a youth of today <laughs> I don't get my cane out. Um, but, yeah, um, I'm, I'm kind of glad I didn't have I didn't have a smartphone at school. But, yeah, me too. Yeah. Like, yes. I mean, I had, I had, I got my first iPhone. This is probably then showing our maybe our slight age differences. I had my first iPhone when I was in year eleven, and that was an iPhone 4S, and that was my didn't first proper exist. smartphone. Didn't even exist when I was in <laughs> year eleven. It didn't even exist. I think I think BlackBerry was still king. Um, oh, I had a BlackBerry yeah. at one point. Mm. Felt like a businesswoman in year eight doing my <laughs> school work or whatever. <laughs> Definitely well, see, didn't I... need a phone like that when I was in year eight, but you know. See, I, I wasn't allowed a BlackBerry. <laughs> Maybe I really nine. wanted Come one. On. I really, really wanted one. All my friends had Blackberries and they were all going like, yeah, BBM me, BBM me. And I was like, <laughs> going like, do you want to text me? <laughs> um with my like really it was like a it was a sat it has a samsung but it had a touch screen but it was like not android it was like fake um like not real anything i was like you text me they're like no because it costs cost me my texts or whatever because it was in the time of you had to pay per text or what, whatever it was yeah that's a film now isn't it my don't was available on netflix but uh, i think it's by hbo i think it's by hbo what about um, that, uh, they about BlackBerry, um, I, I think since um, the social network, there are like so many tech companies, <laughs> there's like so many copies of you know the founding and the rise and fall of certain brands, and uh, BlackBerry's one of them. I forgot what it's called, but it's got the guy from uh, It's Always Funny in it. Oh, okay. So oh, I like very... oh, Rob Rob McHaney, that guy, Rob McHaney, him. Or is that the wrong show? Not not sure. I did, I oh. don't actually watch Parks and um, Parks and Rec. Um, did I say Parks and Rec? You said it's always, always sunny. sunny. It's always, yeah, 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 yeah. It's always sunny. I don't. My my housemate loves the show, but I can't remember what the name of the characters are. But it's oh. a better looking brother, I should say. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm going to wrap it up there as the first. Um, what was it? Cubicle cuticles. What was it? Um... <laughs> cubicle cuticle. Let's. <laughs> Cuba <Good>. Cubicle back. <laughs> Oh, uh, so corridor confab, uh, break room exchange, desk side dialogues. Um, thank you for being the first um, for doing it. Um, it is this is the um, the in between episodes. There will be a big episode um, coming uh, soon. So everyone that's listening, please um, stay tuned and hit the subscribe button, ring that bell. Like smash like no, I'm not doing any of that. 
um, but yeah, thank you so much. I've really had fun, and um, we'll definitely do more of these because I think this is this is bueno. Yeah, thank you for having us.